Labra will always be known in Seattle as the longtime voice of the Sonics, but he has done so much more in his career. He's one of the top play-by-play broadcasters in the country. He's currently the voice of the Portland Trailblazers. Uh, it is great to see you, man. Great to catch up with you. And, and, you know, you have such a passion for what you do. How's everything going down there calling the game that you love? It's going really well, Paul. You know, I've, I've always loved the NBA. I've uh, wanted to be in the NBA since I was – uh, doing high school games back in Indianapolis, Indiana, just because I, I really idolized uh, the Indiana Pacers. I'm from Indianapolis, Indiana. Loved all the Pacer players. Uh, was around when they started their professional organization in '67 when the old ABA, three point shot, red, white, and blue ball. All these great characters at the old Coliseum in downtown Indianapolis. So that was, I mean, that was the thing to do in Indy at the time. Uh, we didn't have any other professional sports at the time. Uh, a, a trip to IU in Bloomington, about an hour away, or West Lafayette, where Purdue is located, about an hour away, was always a, you know, a huge treat. Uh, the Butler Field House, uh, one time hosted the 1968 Olympic tryouts. I remember my dad taking me to that, and seeing Pete Maravich trying out for the Olympic team in 1968, going up against JoJo White of Kansas uh, at the old Field House. So. My, my basketball uh, love and passion goes back to those days uh, in Indy. And I always thought that, you know, if I could just do one NBA basketball game, I would have you know, reached the top of the mountain. But, you know, now I've been doing NBA basketball since I was, uh, well, I, my first gig was with the Kansas City Kings when I was 25. And that would have been like 1984, 83, 84, somewhere in there. And um, I remember that first game that we did. Uh, in Kansas City, thinking, uh, you know, this is uh, uh, this is spectacular. And I get a chance to do 82 of these and maybe some playoff games. So, uh, you know, at the age of 25, I thought, boy, I, I have arrived. <laughs> <laughs> but, I, you know, I never took it for granted. I've always maintained that attitude of, uh, isn't it great to be here doing this game on a February night when it's raining and 40 degrees outside and the team is struggling and you're playing a team that's uh, struggling as well, and there's a smattering of fans in the stands, but I, yet I'm still here doing this game, and you know this is where I want to be. Well, I want to get to your Trailblazers gig and, and how that came about, but, but when you talk about your old jobs and the things you did and how you got into it, you called minor league hockey? I called well. minor league hockey the Central Hockey League, uh, the Indianapolis Checkers, uh, not knowing anything about hockey. Uh, I had served my dues with a radio station there, WIBC in Indianapolis. They were the flagship station of the uh, of the Indiana Pacers, and we had some really great talent uh, on staff. Uh, we had done, uh, we meaning WIBC, they had done the uh, the old Indianapolis Racers of the WHA, which preceded the uh, Central Hockey League, and Wayne Gretzky actually played seven games, I believe, at the age of seventeen until his contract was sold uh, to a group in Edmonton. Nelson Scalvania was the owner, I believe, of the Edmonton Oilers at the time. So Gretzky did get his professional start, believe it or not, in Indianapolis, Indiana, in the, w, the old WHA. Uh, but I was affiliated with the Central Hockey League, the uh, Indianapolis Checkers, and we played at the old downtown Coliseum. And it was my first paid play-by-play job. I had been doing uh, high school basketball, uh, producing a sports talk show. It was an overnight disc jockey for WIBC. It kind of gone, you know, through the whole cycle of stuff uh, for about three years, and they knew that I really wanted to be a play-by-play guy. And it was only a matter of time before I was going to I was going to branch off and go somewhere. Um, and so they, they gave me an opportunity at doing the hockey, and I tell you, I took to it, and I loved, absolutely loved it. I worked by myself, did my own engineering. I did all the interviews during the intermissions, taped interviews, I uh, would go to practice and get these long form five, eight, ten minute interviews that they would slot into uh, the intermission and basically produce the thing by myself. Man, uh, and yeah, man is right. It was <laughs> you were I was immediately thrust into this into this thing, and they were they were very uh, they were confident. They were very patient uh, as long as I you know as long as I did the work, um, and which meant showing up for practice, hanging out with the players, talking to the coaches. You know, being accountable to the to the organization, and then riding on those buses, which is you know a, a good education as well. Because we had we had teams in Cincinnati and Nashville, were our two closest competitors. But then we'd have to jump on a flight, commercial flight, 
and we would fly out to uh, like Oklahoma City because Oklahoma City had a team. Oklahoma City, Wichita, Tulsa, Fort Worth, and Dallas, Nashville, Cincinnati, Indianapolis. Uh, those were our teams. Uh, and so you you know you'd fly out to Oklahoma City and then you you head over to Tulsa and then you'd uh, head down to Dallas Texas and and do a game against the Stars and you'd play Fort Worth Texans and you know uh, How, what was, was the was, longest was bus classic. ride? So the longest bus ride would have probably been from Oklahoma City to Dallas about a three and a half hour bus ride. It actually wasn't too bad. Yeah, you know it was just the the it was. They just weren't connected. The Midwest, you so I had Cincinnati, Nashville, Indy. They just weren't kind of connected. Then your next closest stop, I guess, would be Tulsa and then Oklahoma City. And Wichita was the other one I forgot, the other great stop. Wichita, Tulsa, Oklahoma City, Dallas, and Fort Worth, Texas. Yeah, yeah minor league Oh, hockey. and, and so, uh, I forgot Salt Lake City, <laughs> oh, which was yeah. a great minor league hockey town. The yeah, goals, right. Great hockey, la- yeah. hockey team. And, uh, and, and in fact, uh, as it turned out, that year ended – with the um, the checkers playing uh, the goals in the um, in the Adams Cup final, and they won the Adams Cup championship, so that was kind of fun. Hmm. That's cool. We, but minor league hockey back then, there was brawling. I mean, you imagine you saw quite a few fights. We had a guy by the name of Frank Beaton who was like five foot nothing, and uh, this guy was he had that look. He had the nose that was uh, bent several directions, <laughs> east, west, north, and south, right? <laughs> he had uh, the, the gashes, uh, and, but more, more than that, he had that wild-eyed look. Uh, we called him Beater. And you'd see Beater before a game in the coffee shop just getting hyped up on coffee. <laughs> I mean, just pouring down cups of coffee. <laughs> And you know it was it was a it, it was a great time because yeah you had that element to it, and then we also we also had some snipers some terrific scores, uh, big burly uh, defensemen, wingers that could get out and really go, and we had a terrific young goaltender by the name of Kelly Rudy ah, who cool. was fabulous and Kelly was so he'd have been eighteen just going on eighteen years wow. old wow so you so. saw Rudy in the minors then, we huh? saw Rudy in the minors it was his first gig and. Uh, remember now we were the high minor league, the highest minor league team for the New York Islanders, who were in a stretch of four consecutive Stanley Cup championships. You know this goes back to the seventy nine, eighty, eighty one, eighty two, uh, and they sent me for a hockey education. They sent me to Rye, New York, where the Islanders trained, and. Uh, they sent me out to see Jiggs McDonald, the longtime voice of the New York Islanders, to get an education on how to do hockey. And I mean, I'm just mesmerized. I mean, here's Jiggs, you know, one of the greats, Jiggs McDonald. Um, Al Arbor is a general manager. I'm in the car with Al Arbor, Fred Creighton, who is our coach. Fred had been uh, the head coach in Boston for a spell uh, and had taken on the Atlanta Flames as well. So he had had two NHL stops as head coach, and he is now coaching the high minor league team in Indianapolis. I travel out there with Fred to go see Jiggs, and we're hanging out with, with Al Arbor. Uh, and um, How old were you? I'm, I'm 24 years old. And we roll into Rye, New York, and we get to the rink, and, you know, there they are. There's Trottier, there's Mike Bossy. Wow, Remember Bossy? Oh, he heck was, yeah, man. That, that whole team. Unbelievable Hot talent. Man. Bobby Nystrom. Uh, and who was the, the Kenny, goal- Kenny Morrow was from the, the 80 Olympic team. Kenny yeah, Morrow was, from a, Bowling Green. was, I think, a rookie that year on that squad. <laughs> That's right, Billy man. Smith, the Axe. Billy Smith. You know, in yep. goal. Um, yeah, I mean, the, li- I mean, the list went on and on, you know. What a and, thrill for you. And I'm, I'm, I'm uh, yeah, Clark G- uh, Gillies, yeah, you know, right. um, who was just, that guy was a house, this dude. I mean, and you see these guys up close and on the rink and working out and, and going through the paces. Uh, it's just amazing. And then, of course, our minor league guys, guys are sp- sprinkled in there with them. And so at that point, I don't know who's going to be on our squad, but um, uh, we ended up having, you know, obviously Kelly Rudy. We had another player by the name of Darcy Regeer, a uh, defenseman, and Darcy ended up being a general manager for a number of years in Buffalo. Um, Charlie Scott uh, was a big-time real estate guy in Indianapolis now, and Married one of the Simon girls, Mel and her Simon's uh, the owner of the old owner of the Indiana Pacers. Um, uh, yeah, it's it's interesting to see where some of these guys landed after the minor league days. But they were, 
you know, they, they were all very capable players that I think in any other circumstance, in an expansion circumstance, would have been playing in the NHL. Yeah. I mean, they were very good players. Yeah, guy nowhere to of, go, though. Guy by the name of Red Lawrence. I mean, where is he right now? Red Lawrence, he joined us from Salt Lake, uh, I think, midway through the year. And, you know, the guy was a, a great skater, quick as a cat, and a big-time, big-time shot and goal scorer. Uh, but, you know, it was just fun seeing these characters roll roll in and out. Yeah, man. Boy, those names you yeah. got to saw. Get, you got to see those guys. But, um, well, I noticed you slipped in the uh, the overnight DJ thing. Was that a, was that music? Was it rock, country? Well, yeah, well. On, give I, me you know, something I, from that, from that I wanted, era. I wanted to be like an, uh, an album guy, you know, <laughs> underground radio, the whole thing. And they had a station. I was It was an AM-FM combination, downtown Indianapolis, in a brick building on South Illinois Avenue, uh, Right, right in the middle of just a, a tough, tough neighborhood, and we had sort of our little oasis down there, our, our two-story brick they used to call it. And in the basement was the FM station. That's where all the animals hung out. We caged them down there, and I wanted to be one of the animal. I wanted to be one of the zoo crowd. But uh, they they saw me more as a uh, they wanted me as the overnight uh, middle of the road guy and just play records. And we were actually playing real real vinyl records at the time. <laughs> 45s with, with five five turntables nice. and and then you would uh, and then eventually they put the music on on carts which are just small like cassette type tapes and uh, we would insert those in a in a bank of cartridge players so but that's kind of the year I grew up in it was uh, ripping the wire the the AP wire yeah. editing your own news doing your own news taking your own meter readings all that stuff is as the overnight disc jockey. Yeah, you, know, you taking requests? Yeah. Midnight to five. No, I didn't take any requests. <laughs> now they had, you know, they had a strict uh, policy on, on the, uh, on the playlist. But you know, when you're on from midnight to five, you could stray off the playlist a little bit. I was, I got to admit, I was playing album tracks that I was interested in, <laughs> and that were not even on the playlist. Right. You know, <laughs> and if I needed a break, you know, it's like a, a ten minute, uh, you know, stairway to heaven, you know, or. <laughs> and you never got in trouble, huh? Or Richard it, Harris, MacArthur Park, I think, was 8 minutes, 35 <laughs> seconds. That you got was, it down, don't that you? That was a little more acceptable. <laughs> they would play that. Uh, yeah, it was. Yeah, I, I had it down. There was no question. That's about awesome. That. Yeah. <laughs> well, you talk about those the albums and the records. Did you have? Uh, you must have had an eight-track tape player somewhere in your car at some point in your life. Oh, right? I did. I did. Um, uh what was the most popular eight track you used to throw? Well, out? you know, Earth, Wind, and Fire was always a, a, a favorite of mine. Um, Rare Earth, I think, was you know I had several uh, Rare Earth cassettes. Blood, Sweat, and Tears. Yeah. I really loved David Clayton Thomas. I kind of gravitated toward that kind of stuff. Uh, <laughs> I remember yeah. driving my brother's car in eight track, but it was always Fog Hat. You know, yeah, like- <laughs> yeah Fog Hat. And Frank Zappa. I had my I had a buddy that was into Frank Zappa big time. And he sold me his reel-to-reel tape recorder, and with it came several reels of some some bootleg Frank Zappa. And I'd never been exposed to Frank Zappa, and it changed my life. It really did. <laughs> <laughs> he was he was a great artist, a tremendous <laughs> guitar player. Yeah, really enjoyed that. <laughs> All right, let me let me bring you a little bit back to the present because uh, <laughs> I, that's a great memory lane, though, man. Your broadcast career—that's where it started. But I had no idea that you're going into Staring at the Islanders, you know, that team was legendary. How cool was that? Yeah, it was. Yeah, and for a kid, you know, I'd played a little pond hockey and was kind of raised on Peter Puck. You remember that? Oh, NBC yeah. used to do games. Sure. And I used to listen a lot to Dan Kelly on KMOX radio, same station that would air the Cardinal games with Jack Buck. So in the summer, you'd listen to Jack Buck do Cardinals, one of the best of all time. Dan Kelly, unfortunately, passed away uh, way too soon, but he was one of the really fine voices in the NHL and used to do the national package uh, when NBC first got it. And he was, he was dynamic and he was on KMOX radio. So you'd listen to Dan in the winter, do the hockey. You know, you're growing up in Indiana. You're not, you're not really thinking much about hockey, but boy, you listen to that voice and his description, the whole thing, like, man, that, that sounds like a really cool sport. So we get out, we play a little pond hockey. My brothers and I were just, we were hooked on it, you know, from about, oh, I'd say 14, 15 years old. You know, we we bought skates, made that big investment to get those Bowers or oh, CCMs. Yeah. Yeah, you know, right. oh, yeah, that's right. And then, oh, you're off to the races now, and you go find a the, a pond that's just got about an inch of ice on it. You know, it's crack. You're out there literally playing. You, you can, can hear, hear it. it crack. <laughs> you can't hear it crack. <laughs> 
Oh, man. Yeah. It's a dangerous it, game it, you're playing, oh, it's man. It's a dangerous <laughs> game, man. You're trying to avoid your little brother putting a shot to you, and then you're trying to, of course, keep above water. You know, it <laughs> adds a different element to the game. We we just badgered our mom. My dad would have n- nothing to do with it, but we badgered my mom into, into getting the skates eventually. And, uh, yeah, we – and then we – it was either – you either got the CCMs, the Bauer, or then the Lang. Lang, the Lang yes. came out with like a molded. That was my, my skate. And my little brother got the molded Lang. Yeah. yeah those they, were cool. Because I had already gotten the, the, the Bowers, you know, <laughs> kind of the old school Bowers, which I really loved. Yeah. I got them. I still have them somewhere at home. Yeah. Oh, man. I never thought when you came in today we, we'd be talking about Lang skates, man. Oh, that, yeah, yeah. That yeah. is a memory for me, for, for sure. sure. <laughs> uh, this Blazers gig that you have, you know, you're, you're – able to watch Dame Lillard and some of these stars every night. Um, how much fun is it to, to, to be a part of this organization now? This is your third season down there, I yeah, think? It's my fourth season. Fourth season. And um, it's, been, it's been terrific just to see the growth of the team uh, and see the various iterations and, and development of Dame, CJ, CJ McCollum. These two guards are, I mean, spectacular. They are... Uh, this year, the you know the highest scoring guard tandem combined, they're averaging nearly forty nine points a game, and these guys just come out and are just exquisite shooters. They, in fact, I was telling Dame the other day, I said they they, they remind me a little bit of uh, that shooting ability that Ray Allen had. I mean, they have different styles of game, but just night in and night out, knowing that these guys from distance, because the the distance of these shots now from three is, is it's taken on a whole different level now. I mean, these guys are. They're letting fly from 30 to 35 feet with accuracy, you know, with close to 35% accuracy. It's just, it's amazing. Um, and Steph Curry, of course, started that, Harden, and Damian Lillard to, to an extent. So the game has changed a lot from the days when we were doing the Sonic games. It's the three-point shot now is just, is everything in the NBA. Yeah. Um, just because, you know, you shoot 35% from three, it's the equivalent of shooting 50% from inside the arc, a two-point shot. So the, the mid-range shot, while it's still a weapon, and it certainly is, and, and C.J. McCollum, our, our off guard, is one of the top guys in the league at the mid-range. The emphasis, though, is on getting out there beyond that three-point arc and firing those, letting those things go seven or eight times a game. And, you know, if you're shooting north of 35%, that's a big weapon. So it's been, it's been interesting the last four years to see even in the last four or five years, see that become uh, the end-all and be-all of offenses. And defenses have gotten – they're a more exotic course than they, they have been in the past. Uh, but the athletes are still unworldly, uh, the most elite in the world without question. And uh, somehow – they continue to develop, and year in and year out, there's always some like Luka Doncic. Now, I mean, yeah. it's, it's just, obviously it's a world game, and Doncic comes around after you thought you'd seen it all with you know with Kobe and LeBron and uh, Giannis and Dedekumpo, you know, another kid from from Greece, who has uh, Nigerian parentage. Uh, he, he's an extraordinary player. Harden makes getting forty every night look. Like child's play, it's just it's ridiculous how good a scorer he is. So we're seeing some extraordinary uh, Anthony Davis. We're seeing some extraordinary players right now in the NBA. So it's it's you know it's it's great to be around it uh, with and LeBron having an MVP year, 17 years in, he's going to turn 30 at the uh, 35 at the end of the month, and the guy's still playing at just an incredible level, leading the league in assists. I was going to save that for later, but since you bring it up, you know the the dynamic of Davis and, and LeBron down there. Uh, that team uh, with Frank Vogel uh, as the yeah. coach seems to be right where I don't I don't know if anybody expected them to be as good as they are this early. I didn't think they would be because uh, I I just didn't know who on court would get them settled, get them into their sets, distribute, and and so forth. Now we I mean we've known that LeBron's just a phenomenal passer. I think his career average is something like six assists a game, which is it, for a guy it's close to 6'9 and 255, 260 pounds. He's just, uh, uh, they, they broke the mold when they made this guy. Um, but for him to then take that to a whole nother level, getting nearly 11 assists a game uh, with Kuzma, who was nicked up at the beginning of the year, you know, the great talent out of Utah, uh, who, who they expect to be, you know, uh, one, of the, one of the budding stars there in Los Angeles. I just kind of wondered, all right, 
who you know who else do they put around them? Because they they traded a heck of a lot of talent to get Anthony Davis on board when they when they did the deal with New Orleans. But LeBron has answered all those questions, and Anthony Davis has remained upright. I mean, he's had a history of you know nagging injuries here or there, but he's right now he's got a, a, a second wind as well. And you see those two guys run a pick and roll combination. Uh, I don't know how you defend that, and it's just only a matter of time before they get a few more scores, shooters out on the perimeter to even widen the floor more, which is going to make it even more difficult to defend these guys. Uh, and again. Because of the emphasis of a three-point shot, they, I think, are going to need that perimeter shooting. And then, you know, there's rumors out there that Chris Paul somehow is going to join forces with him. Right now he's in a holding pattern there in Oklahoma City, and they want to blow things up there because uh, they've got, I think, eight first-round draft choices in the next five years, three, four, five years, something like that. And um, they're, they're looking to make a transition too. So I don't expect Chris Paul to be there much longer. And – he could be joining forces with the Lakers, which makes it even more difficult in the West. But isn't Chris Paul getting a ton of dough from, like, how in the world would the Lakers be able to fit him? He's making $35 million, so, yeah, <laughs> and for the next couple of years. Yeah. But you know what? Um, you go over the cap and you pay the tax. Yeah. You know, as the Blazers will tell you, if, if you want to win, that's the game you're in. <laughs> you know? Well, you bring up the three-point ball and, and – and you talk about Lillard's shot that put OKC out for the season in the playoffs last yeah. spring. And he said afterward that was for Seattle. Um, and he mean mugged and, and the whole thing. And, and that was a, an incredible shot that he had to just bury them and end it. But when you heard him say that, uh, did, how, did that ring true for you? Like, was that just kind of like, wow. That, because no one, when people up here heard that, it was like, whoa, he really said that about, yeah. you know, did that surprise you? Um. That Dame said it, not really, because he's really aware of uh, the history of basketball, what happened in Seattle, and has a great appreciation for the game and the history of the game. And so I don't think it was lost on him at all. You know, he and Westbrook, I don't, I don't think they were at odds, at least from Dame's standpoint. I don't think he perceived it as a me against him type thing. It's always been a team game for Dame. It's always about it's it's us, it's our group uh, trying to beat the Oklahoma City Thunder. It's not about me versus him because if we get into that type of back and forth, then everything goes by the wayside, everything you've worked for. Then it just becomes a personal thing and a selfish thing. And he's he's about the team, he's about the group, he's about being very unselfish. So Westbrook actually is a guy that on the floor, you know, he's just got to have somebody, right, that he sees as – trying to cut in on his turf or his territory, even if it's imagined. And I think that he, he just he takes it uh, to heart, this one-on-one -on -one battle, at the expense of his team, I believe. And I think that's what happened to Oklahoma City. He came in there thinking, all right, you know, I'm, this, is, this is me against Dame, and I, I've got to show him that I'm the better point guard. You know, even though Dame had been named, let's see, last year he was second All-NBA, and the year before he was first-team All-NBA. Mm. So here's Westbrook battling the first, the reigning first team All NBA in a playoff series, and they had beaten the Blazers 4-0 in the regular season. So Westbrook came in there full of himself, and he left with Dave waving at the Oklahoma City bench bye bye yeah. as he's mobbed after hitting that shot with you know point nine on the clock, knocking it down as he did from three point range. Oof. Yeah. You know, <laughs> it was a heck of a shot. That was unbelievable. It was an unbelievable yeah. shot is right. I mean, w w Lillard talks about loyalty. You're right. He, um, I think I read where he said he would never switch up is the words he no, used. No, he's never going to chase a championship. Yeah. He wants the championship in Portland. He wants it to be there, and he, he wants to be a part of it. And uh, he, he will remain in Portland as long as they want him, as management wants him in there, as long as he's taking a breath and – playing basketball, he's going to be a blazer. He wants to end his career with the Portland Trailblazers, you know, like Reggie Miller did with the Indiana Pacers. Dirk Nowitzki did with the Dallas Mavericks. I mean, he – he, uh, I, I believe him. I don't think there's any doubt about that. And, of course, they maxed out his contract, and he's he's linked – he and CJ are linked up to big-time deals through uh, 2025, so they're going to be together. And his work ethic, too. I mean, you um, you know way more than I do, of course, because you see these guys on an everyday basis, but – He's into boxing and yeah, and does he, a lot of boxing in the off season. Yeah. Loves the footwork, the hand speed. 
And the knowledge of the sport too, right? The contact and loves boxing. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he's, I am not a boxing fan, so I don't even presume to get into a discussion about boxing with, with Damian Lillard. But you can see he, he, he tweets out all the time when they've got these prize fights on. You know, he'll, he'll give them an up or down on, you know, and give you a little bit of, uh, a little bit of analysis on the on the boxing as well. Yeah, yeah. but he'll so he'll hit the bag himself and do his deal like he's he Speed trains bag, a bit like a boxer bag, in the, the office. Thing, yeah, he'll do a lot of that stuff because he wants to stay off his feet as much as he can because of all the miles that he logs yeah. during the year. Because he once again this year both he and CJ are in the in the top five in minutes played in the league. I mean these guys are playing long minutes. You know Dame's playing nearly thirty seven and a half minutes a night, so mm-hmm. that's that's unheard of. It really is to carry your team. Uh, to have to play night in and night out, play those big minutes, uh, it's difficult. Are you surprised at how well Carmelo Anthony is doing? I am. I am. I, I, and... I had serious doubts I, because when he was with Oklahoma City, um, he, you know, he, he was not a defender on the floor. And I, my feeling was when we played him that I wanted to see Carmelo on the floor because he wasn't lighting you up from three and he wasn't doing that much from mid-range. And I, I just my perception of him when when the Blazers were playing him is leave him on the floor. The guy I don't want to see is Jabari Grant coming out and shooting threes and defending the way he does. Now he's now in Denver, and it's a great pickup for him. But um, so I was surprised that they they reached out to Carmelo. Plus he had had a, nearly a year off. He only played the ten games with Houston, and then you know basically is sitting and. So you're looking at Carmelo, class of 03. You know, he's 34 years old. He's been in the league 17 years. Came out the same year that LeBron did. He was the third pick. LeBron was the number one. And I thought, uh, we're at a point, though, offensively, where it can't get any worse. And it was a non-guaranteed deal. And to me, like, okay, it's, it's a win-win. He gets back in the league. You, obviously, at the same time, there was so much – attention and national media paid to what the, the Blazers are doing and at the same time we had our offense was running on low we had our five man doesn't start the year and is going to be out for some time Yusuf Nurkic broke his leg back in March and then Zach Collins our starting four man goes down to a season ending uh, surgery for the, the left shoulder the labrum and you, you've added six new guys to your roster from last year, a team that won 53, and things didn't start out of the gate very well for a number of those guys. They were all experiencing personal lows and shooting percentage and so forth. First 13 of the first 18 games are on the road, so it was a difficult spell, uh, and the Blazers had dropped two, three games under 500, and I thought, well, why not? You know, uh, Plus, here for me, this is what sold me is that uh, Dame and CJ had been after the guy for the last two years. I mean, before he got out of New York and headed to Oklahoma City, there, I think, was some interest uh, with Dame and CJ in, in Carmelo, and then there was when he got to Oklahoma City, and then even more so when you know, things weren't working out in Oklahoma City and you knew he was, gonna, his, he was heading off to Houston. And then and last year when Houston let him go, well, the, the heat got even ratcheted up even hotter. And C.J. worked out with a guy in the summer in New York for the last couple of summers. And so C.J. was saying, hey, the guy's still got it, still got his lift. And sure enough, I mean, he's, he's been outstanding. You know, he's getting close to 15 points a game, and he's shooting, you know, he probably he'll be a little better by the end of the year. He's down around, I don't know, 41% or so and shooting close to 32 33% from three. But he's going to get you 15 points, and he still can rebound. He can still get four or five boards. Now, defensively, has he ever been a stopper? Nope. Doesn't claim to be. But he's a good communicator on defense. And I, I think the Blazers' need was more offense than it was defense because they just they – just, you can get away with being a, a top-10 scoring team and being a bottom-third defensive team. You can win – enough games to make it into the playoffs but if you're not scoring and defensively you have liabilities you're going nowhere (laughs) so yeah i i i I agree with the decision ultimately but at first i have my doubts yeah well it does it it seems like a good fit and uh i'm surprised that terry stotts is in his eighth season down there i mean uh 
it, time flies. It's yeah. crazy how long he's been down there. Yeah, and, and he's done a great job. <clears throat> They've been to the playoffs the last six years, and he's the second winningest uh, coach in the history of the organization. Uh, has a, a terrific coaching staff, and and the players love the guy because he gives them he gives them freedom. Um, and his offense is designed to really accentuate their their abilities. Yeah, he's a big believer in the offense. Well, he was uh, in the mid '90s or much of the '90s. He was George Carl's assistant in Seattle. Uh, and the one highlight I won't forget, and I've talked to Terry about this years, a few years back, um, when, <laughs> when you were right there on the court side, I'm sure when George went after Bennett Salvatore, the the, the referee yeah. Oh, yeah, that yeah, night, yeah, yeah, yeah. and he was going uh, just nuts. I've never seen George. You may have. I have never seen him lose it like that. And it was uh, he got a technical. Sean Kemp was trying to hold him back, and he got a te- he got tossed. Um, just for holding George back that night, I think. <laughs> but, you know, when you see do you remember that melee? What do you remember about that melee? I don't remember much about that other than uh, it It seemed to be business as usual because George had a quick temper. Uh, he had a trigger. And he it didn't. He would go, he'd go at just about anybody. He'd go at his own general manager. He'd yeah. go at his own point guard. He went at Bob Hill when Bob Hill had the job down in San Antonio. I remember that. He, and they had to, they had to separate he and Bob Hill because they were marching down. They were getting ready to go to, to war. A couple old, you know, old warriors going at it. Um, so that that's probably what I remember most about George. Uh, boy, he would he could get on your nerves too. He, I mean, he and I had a couple of uh, shouting matches. When you know he just got a little crazy toward the end. Really, you know, like you, oh, you, because you, George. I'd I'd try to interview George, and you know he would say some crazy stuff to me, off the air that was a little personal, and then I'd go at him, and he'd come back at me, and then I I I I remember one interview session. I kind of walked out. And he goes, "What about the interview? We're not going to do the interview." I said, "George, I I really don't care. You can interview yourself, man. I'm out of here." <laughs> man, you know it so was that bad. It at was times, that. Huh? It got it would it would get bad with George, but I, you know what? That's when George would appreciate you most is when you'd, when you'd fire back at him because I think that's what he really – he fed off of that. He really loved that static. And, uh, you know, there's some people that can operate in those kind of circumstances. I'm one that I can probably go there a little bit. Uh, I can live in that world. Uh, but there are a lot of people that can't. that just don't – just do not want the conflict, don't want the static. And uh, you had to know how to you had to deal with that when when you were with when you were around George. There was no doubt about it. But his players, I think, were the, of the same cut. His players would give it back. Yeah, uh, go right back at him. You know, anything they'd get, they go right back. At him. Would Gary do it? it would, oh yeah, Gary. Oh my gosh, yeah. He and Gary were constantly squabbling. But that was kind of the dynamic of that team. That was the beauty of that team. You know, you'd have guys like Detlef Shrimp. You'd have the adults in the room like Detlef, like Hersey Hawkins, Sam Perkins. I mean, you think back to the right those guys yep. and and then think about the uh, and Steve Scheffler you think about and then you think about the other players who were on that squad you know you had the the, the great talent of Sean Kemp but the guy was it, Kemp was immature you know Kemp was undisciplined in some some regard and then you had Gary Payton who was just another just atomic bomb just this guy was you'd go to war with Gary but you knew that there were some things about Gary it would just drive you nuts so you had to have the right group with them, and I thought that that was the, the beauty um, of of the melding of the certain players, like like the Hawk Perkins uh, Shrimp contingent, and then you know the young talent. Then you had the role guys around them, like a Frank Brakowski. You'd bring up a Vincent Askew, a uh, couple other guys whose names right now elude me, but you know, and you meld them together. That that was the proper ingredient for five years for that team. Well, I imagine Nate McMillan was like, and Nate McMillan. Guys. I mean, and, and I take Nate for for granted. You know, like yeah, Mac Ten. He's part of that adult group because he'd always have Gary's back. You know, you had Hawk, you had Nate, and and Gary. What a what a three guard rotation. Yeah, man. I mean, think about that. <laughs> and then they had Eric Snow, the rookie from Michigan State, who was you know a nice practice player, kept his mouth shut, but you know was just a great team guy. But Nate, yeah. Um, but what about story? Like Nate you, was phenomenal. You, you, yeah, Nate was awesome, and I'm always pulling for him, you know, as a head coach. But when you talk about George, like, is there a 
<laughs> is there a, a story that you can t- share from like some conflicts, some things that? Because I know we didn't get along with Wally. Um, yeah, Wally that was Walker. always it. That was always, he'd always see. So he he uh, accused me of being a Wally spy, and that just dro- that's that was the case in point I was talking about when we were in the interview session. Like, George, I, that's such a paranoid, stupid thing to say. <laughs> you know, it's just it's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. You know, because I was. I was the guy that was driving George downtown. When he got to town, didn't have a car for a week. I would drive him downtown to practice after he got to town because he lived real close to me there in Bellevue. So I would drive him downtown, you know, on my on my way in. So, uh, you know, and I got to know him and his family before anybody else did. And then and then he comes up with this cockamamie stuff. You know, you kind of laugh, and then you just call BS on him and go right back at him. Yeah. And he just thought, you know, he just thought he was being cute. When in fact, you know, he's being a moron. You know, you tell him that, and you know, and then he drop it. <laughs> but he was—he was for years the most quotable coach in the NBA. Oh, and look, I had no qualms with his activity on the floor, or the way he dealt with the media. Uh, he, you know, and I'd see him play one writer against the other, favorites, you know, one against the other. Oh yeah, he—he he would play him. There's no doubt about that. <laughs> and that, you know, that's of course that's pre-internet. Right. Free Twitter. Can you imagine now? Uh, no, there'd be a storm every day. <laughs> when you, uh, you, know, you probably have been asked this question a lot, but I'm going to rephrase it a little bit differently. I think not only will would the NBA come back to Seattle, or will it? But but if it happens, um, is it going to be a relocation? Is it going to be an expansion team? Or maybe it's not going to happen at all. What do you think? Well, I don't think it will happen until the 2025 TV deal is hammered out. And they're probably working on that as we speak. But in the world now, media, as you know, Paul, things change at just a a lightning speed. Uh, An Amazon, a Netflix, some company we haven't even conceived of yet could pop up in the next year or two or Amazon and buy a portion of the NBA rights. I mean, you don't know. It's all if 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 they figure content is king and they've got a way to sell it and they've got a way they've got a tube and a channel to get it out to a mass audience through streaming or whatever it may be, uh, then it, it to me it changes the whole landscape of uh, where the NBA is going uh, with, with their television dollars, which drives I think their ability to expand or not expand and 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 then drives their decision making process on do we leave some of these less viable markets that are smaller markets and take uh and and, and go back and, and take another swing in, in Seattle where they had forty one years of history. Clearly they have a brand new building. They have another competing faction that's got space right over here in Soto that uh you know given a green light by certain constituencies would you know probably do a building as well so there are a lot of options in seattle for the nba i don't think there's any doubt about that um in terms of relocation it's hard to say you know where that would come from but i think it's going to come from a market that's struggling that's in a smaller market and right now is is only viable because of the huge national tv dollars getting one thirtieth of a big national tv contract you know will solve a lot of ills um but end of the day, you know, you got to be able to generate your own revenue within that market, and and ticket sales is going to be big too. And then you got to figure out how do we keep free agents in those markets, and that's a difficult proposition as well. So, um, all that's at play. But I would say 2025, and I couldn't tell you if it would be a relocated team or if it would be expansion. Um, when you hear the commissioner talk about expansion, it's he really is enamored with. The idea of an international expansion of some sort, if it's Mexico City or a division in Europe or something of that nature. So stay tuned. Yeah. 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 But it all depends, again, on on those TV dollars and, yeah. and how you get it out to the mass audience. Well, that'd be something. What they would... You know, is it Turner? Is it ESPN? Is it ABC? Is it the current template? Or will it be, as, as I've mentioned, will it be, you know, some player we haven't thought of yet? Hmm. Sean Kemp just turned 50. Um and I know you had a message for him as well uh, for this big celebration he had. They had something in town, but it, the question came up where he got the Rain Man nickname, and 
and everybody thinks you gave it to him. But but you're here to like I know you yeah. didn't. So set yeah. so set people straight that are curious. Yeah, no, I, I've I've told people this. Uh, people have asked me about this. It was the Costacos brothers, who were operating uh, out of an office in West Seattle, and they were doing posters, and they did posters for NBA teams and NFL teams, and um, and, and really did some uh, some interesting work. Personalized them, uh, made them very unique. Um, and, and, and blended in, uh, some iconic elements of the city where these athletes are located. So with Sean Kemp, remember the poster of Sean dunking, kind of sailing over the space needle. We've, we've got a couple of those posters framed at home. And so it was Costacos brothers. And they, I remember up on the concourse, they were selling some merchandise up there and they had a couple of. Uh, Rain Man uh, posters there in the in the kiosk, and um, I, I don't know how I missed it because my kids had most of these posters everywhere. But I just the, the suddenly saw this before a playoff series against the Golden State Warriors, and wow, I see this Rain Man, and I just thought that is that's brilliant. And I don't know why, but I hadn't incorporated it before. But the opportunity came during a game then in one of the playoff games against Golden State Warriors when Gary grabbed that outlet and he was in backcourt and Kemp was ahead and he throws that lob pass up ahead to Sean and of course you know we all remember how violent he would throw those dunks down and the kind of velocity that that he got before he would just boom spring out of nowhere and and sail up over the rim and throw it down and you know and and Alton Lister goes down and and then I exclaimed something about the rain man and uh, you know KJR would replay all the clips and stuff and then they were replaying it the next day and the fans just thought you know that's hey where did that come from? You know, that's, that's spectacular. And, you know, it came from the Costacos brothers and the, and the, uh, and the poster. And, you know, and, and, and of course, that's just such a limited audience, too, at the time. Mar- NBA marketing wasn't, you know, it wasn't one hundred one one hundredth of what it, of what it is now. So you just didn't see that poster except in these little shops, you know, that were in arena. Yeah. There was nowhere else people would see those. So it was kind of a cultish, clickish type thing. And uh, I don't know, people liked it. So yeah, you brought that thing to life. So so we hung in there with it. Man, I mean, you have some of the most memorable play calls uh, in Sonics history for sure. Are those most of those spur of the moment when you look back? Are they spur of the moment calls or something that you thought of like throughout live and say, you know, I got to work that into a game? Uh, Most of it was, uh, I think, spur of the moment. Uh, You know, there were there were. And usually because I was working with Marcus Johnson, you know, Marcus would always, I mean, that guy had such a creative, has such a creative uh, imagination and and way about him on the air. He's now doing the Milwaukee Bucks games and just does a terrific job. I enjoy listening to him. You guys, I'll just stop you real quick. You guys were awesome. I mean, yeah, well, thank you. Yeah, Yeah. he, he, I mean, we, we kind we came from the same, I graduated in 78 and he was out in 77, I guess it was out of UCLA, and I was at, at, at Butler. So we had kind of the same sort of exposure to, to modern culture and so forth, same TV shows, music, essentially. Uh, you know, I mean, there's a world of difference between growing up in, in Southern California, Los Angeles, and Indianapolis. I get that. Uh, but but there was a lot of commonality there. So, yeah, we, we shared some some good times. We had, a, we had a great time. So a lot of that stuff just – was born of talking to him off the air about just stuff. Yeah. You know, and then we get on the air and we'd just be talking about the same stuff. And people people love that because they, they feel like they're getting in on the conversation on, you know, what these guys are talking about at a Sonic game during the game. Yeah. And that, that was that was a lot of fun. Yeah. And I, and I felt like if I could make him laugh on the air, then I know people, you know, at home were, were, were laughing. And same thing. I, I mean, I'm laughing at him more than he's laughing at me. <laughs> you know what? You he's held yourself laughing together. at me because I'm screwing stuff up. You know? <laughs> yeah. But, you know, it's funny you would say that because, you know, you always you, – you had to hold it together because you had to keep this train going down the track. You know, you, you want to get too sidetracked yeah. during a game. Yeah, so, and we were doing simulcasts, so we were doing it for right. a radio and TV audience. And uh, that that always worked out well. I think most people were okay with it. Um, you know, there were some radio listeners that would get bent out of shape with me a little bit because, you know, I wasn't describing where the play was or – uh, we go off on a tangent and, and some of these, you know, tangents with stories and so forth. And the radio audience is left in the, 
in the dark. But for the most part, I thought it worked out. We, and we did it for 15 years before they finally said, you know what? We're calling it, we're calling it quits. We're going to split this up. There's more revenue in selling the radio side and the TV side. And so yeah. they, they did that. Yeah, I always thought when you got that gig, because I've been here for 26 years, so I knew when you got that gig, it was like they were asking him to do what? And, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, but it felt like it was, uh, you know, as an outsider looking in, it felt like a penny pinching move. It felt like, oh, let's get Kevin to do yeah. both. We'll save some money on the broadcast. And, and it was, <laughs> it was, <laughs> uh, you know, it, it was, it was somewhat of that. But um, Barry Ackerley, uh, at the time, you got to remember, uh, the Los Angeles Lakers were the model organization, and so when Barry bought the team, I think he recognized that Chick Hearn down in Los Angeles was pulling it off in a market like that with a team like that, then why couldn't we pull it off in Seattle with, you know, kind of the right combination of guys? And so, you know, they brought me in and um, and I did the radio with Bob Blackburn, the original voice of the Sonics, and we did it for uh, for two years, alternating quarters back and forth. And then they made a change on the TV side. When Jimmy Jones, who was just a terrific TV talent, he had some health issues I think they were concerned about, and so um, they, they, Jimmy didn't come back. And then my, my third year with the, the club, they decided, all right, we're going to move you over to TV, but we're also we're going to simulcast. So they just decided. And that was a big move. It was a big, bold move. And I think I was too young and dumb to realize what kind of a big move it was, uh, which probably was good uh, because I just – I was myself and just did my – just did my play-by-play and just was me and kind of let my personality run uh, with it a little bit. And it turned out to be okay. The first year I worked with Rick Barry. Hmm. Rick Barry was a a color announcer. And Rick taught me a lot about the NBA and about the mechanics of the game and so forth and and a lot about announcing. Rick was really good, and he was a stickler uh, for everything. But like a lot of his projects, he just he'd come and go. I mean, one year and he lost interest and he was out. Uh, but it was it was it was a good year for me. That was my third year with the Sonics. We you bring up Rick Barry, and, and I always think of Brent Barry because he was outstanding yeah. for us in the media. You know, he was the fun guy to chat with, and and uh, I remember asking him about his relationship with Gary, and he's like, you know what, we're not going out for dinner after the game. Yeah. But as far as on the floor, you know, we'll be just fine. Yeah. And um, and I just thought that was interesting. It kind of brought a little perspective to some of these guys where they're teammates, but. You know, it doesn't mean they got to be buddies when they leave the arena. No, I mean, you need your space. Goodness gracious. And you need to have your own identity. That's that's healthy. I mean, that's healthy for the team. Yeah. Uh, it really is. Just be able to get away, get you, get into your own type of thing and with your family, your friends or whatever, and, 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 and get there. It's I think it's when you become uh, isolated uh, and, and in your own group and you just kind of punch the clock and show up and get out that sometimes that's that's I think when players get into trouble a little bit yeah when they're not out in the community and they kind of insulate themselves a little bit from it uh and they're not identifiable by uh by the fans as being one of them or having an interest in the community I think that's where Lillard really excels Lillard is he's he's constantly available within the community it's not like he's coming to Portland and then uh you know taking off and living in LA for the next three months or something like that man he's just he's setting down roots raising his son and doing his camps in in Portland out in Beaverton and yeah he's plugged in yeah yeah the city's lucky to have him um I want to ask you a couple more questions uh just before we wrap it up uh Crawford Jamal Crawford are you surprised that he has not been picked up yeah, but there's still time, and there's always a need for shooting. Mm-hmm. And the last game he played with Phoenix, I think he scored 50. <laughs> I know, that nuts. Man, oh, man. I call him the Benjamin Button of the NBA because he just gets younger, man. He just he is. He just gets younger. So I think, yeah, I think with two things, Dwight Howard uh, coming on with the Lakers and uh, having the kind of first month and a half that he did, I think that in some regards gave critics of – um, Carmelo Anthony, uh, a little bit of latitude to say, well, it's working for Dwight. It'll work for Carmelo. And then for Carmelo now to work, come in, get plugged in, score the way he has, I think people are, may look toward Jamal now and say, you know, uh, you can always use some scoring. It's had a positive impact in Portland. It's got to have an, a positive impact with us. I mean, there there have been some guys around, you know, in media around in Portland that are kind of openly wondering, like, Geez, you can never get enough good shooting. Why wouldn't you, you know, 
yeah. take a run at Jamal Crawford at this point. So I don't know. Stay tuned. We'll see. December 15th is coming up, and that's when all these free agents that were signed this summer are uh, eligible to be traded. And so uh, there could be a lot of activity. And then for you know guys that are out there as free agents, uh, some opportunity as well, I would think. Yeah, I would think the first window that opens that he would be one of the first phone calls a GM oh, yeah. makes yeah. for sure. Um, how about Steve Ballmer? To see uh, you, you know the the excitement he brings and the passion he brings, he's he's crazy. He's crazy excited in, in the exciting yeah. way. Uh, he's good TV. He's, he's jumping all over the place. He's ripping shirts. Uh, you know, has it been interesting at the very least to watch him and what he's done with the Clippers franchise? Yeah, I mean, he knew what he was up against with the Clippers. Uh, I talked to him a couple of times, and he said, you know, the Clippers just don't have – we don't have a legacy. You know, we haven't won championships. They've always been the second of the of the two teams in town, uh, the basketball teams. And then, you know, you layer in the, the, the baseball and the football and so forth and the hockey. They, You know, they're at the bottom. They were just so poorly run. So he's – He's taken over an organization that was poorly run, that had a bad culture, as we all know. No point in revisiting that. And he knew what he was up against, and he just he 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 decided, you know, we got to build our own legacy here. Uh, and he's, of course, he's attempting to get his own building, uh, not to be the the number three there at Staples Center, but have his own building. And uh, he's hands on, man. I'll tell you that. You know, he's hiring his announcers down there. They got a good young announcers doing tv they hired um uh, noah eagle ian eagle's son oh to do really the radio yeah mm-hmm. and i think he'll do a fantastic job and you know it's it's not enough to get the ancillary stuff you got to have you got to have the horses you got to have the talent and to, to pull off that Kawhi leonard deal and and then paul george the way he has and uh, to have a great coach in doc rivers uh, they're off to just, you know, they're off to, I hate to say it, they're off to a great start. They're going to be hard to beat. Yeah. Well, that whole West is going to be, I mean, it's, that's, yeah. at, least good, at least the Blazers have, kind of they started slow, but it seemed to have gotten a, they've gotten a yeah, feeling. Yeah, injuries are going to just, uh, it's, it's, it's just been an injury ravaged year, you know, for the, for the Blazers. Um, I can see a path, though, for them moving forward to getting a playoff seed. And if they can get their starting five-man Nurkic back, and if they could get Zach Collins back at the end of the year, that would be a team that would be nightmarish to play in the first round. You know, it wouldn't be a team, obviously, that would have home court advantage, but it would it would be a team that would take the measure, uh, certainly, of a, a Lakers, the, the Clippers, Denver right now, Houston. I mean, those are your solid top four teams with the – Salt Lake City, uh, with Jazz being in there, probably at number five, and then Dallas at number six. Uh, although Dallas could ascend, I mean, with 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 Doncic, I mean, right now I think they're third right now in the in the West. I don't think they'll be there at the end of the year, but that's six solid teams right there. And then, but the seven and the eight seeds are wide open. You know, Minnesota, Phoenix, uh, Zion Williamson at some point is going to be back with New Orleans. Uh, Sacramento comes up with a big win now and then. Um, all those teams, the Blazers, are going to have to scramble over to get into the eighth seed. It, it, right now they're having that discussion. The fan base is having that discussion in Portland. It's like, all right, do we, do we just kind of bandage this together and, and limp out the year and make just to be the eighth seed? or do you? And the, and the fans love this term, but we on the organizational side hate it. Or do you tank the year and play for the draft? You know, it's like, wow. You know, which is just a uh, – to me, to me, it's kind of a false choice. Um, I think my, my personal opinion is that uh, given the difficulty of, of the schedule uh, that they've been through now, I think you just pray for, for improved health uh, and that the, the core that you have currently can just win enough games to stay at or around 500 until – uh, you get help sometime either through a blockbuster deal that could be pulled off in season or until you can get those players back toward the end of the season in the spring. Yeah, so it'll be a, uh, the month of January, I think, will tell, uh, wh- you know, which direction they go. Man. Yeah. <laughs> still fun for you, though. It's still – yeah, it's still fun for me. <laughs> you know, it's, it's always interesting. Man, oh, Particularly man. with that ownership group. I mean, Jody Allen's been great. Uh, she's – proven that she's willing to spend any amount of money for the organization, whether it be signing Dame and CJ to the extensions or the extension to Neil O'Shea, the general manager, or the uh, 
uh, Terry Stotts in the off season as well. You know, she recognizes good talent. She wants to keep him around, and so we'll see what happens. Yeah, jo- Jody uh, seems to show her passion for the Seahawks franchise as well. Um, but you know, as a, as, a, as a guy looking in there, and you know how passionate Paul was about the Trailblazers. Yeah. I mean, that was his thing, and um, it felt like he did the Seahawks just for a favor for Seattle. <laughs> but I mean, you know, he enjoyed it, got the Super Bowl, and um, and and became a champion in that in that sport. And I'm, and I'm sure he would, Jody would love to see those Trailblazers, uh, oh, yeah. win a championship. Well, it was his first love. You know, he came mm-hmm. to town. He bought him in '85 uh, when he was 35 years old. So. Uh, and the organization, this is celebrating their 50th year. And um, I, I, the stories you hear about Paul were interesting because he was a guy that really prided himself as being uh, one that had a keen eye for talent, basketball talent. And he was always involved in the draft, right down to, like, who are we taking in the second round? You know, let's, now let's talk about second round. Or undrafted uh, free agents that were out there. You know, where, where are we going with that? It was very very on top of of players and player acquisition and so forth and took a, a keen interest in he that. did yeah I remember sitting down with former GM Bob Witsit and he would say Paul would call him you know every morning of a game say how are we looking at yeah. and, and he was you know and I never knew he was that passionate about that franchise yeah. and that sport he really did love it yeah you know, no there's 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 no question about that um yeah, you know, and he was frequently at games down on the baseline. We'd see him on the road uh, quite a lot, uh, just kind of show up unannounced. Hey, Paul's at the game uh, here in New Orleans. Oh, that's great. You know, occasionally we'd come down and say hello and, you know, hey, wish the fans back there, you know, Merry Christmas and holidays and Thanksgiving and so forth. Um, but he, he, from our perspective, he was he was a pretty shy guy. He didn't We didn't interact a lot with him. Uh, he actually hired me, um, well, this goes back now three years ago, or four, four seasons now, um, but I was doing an ESPN radio game, uh, one of the uh, Warrior Blazer second round playoff games, and he came up and was talking to P.J. Carlissimo, who, of course, is former Blazer coach, and P.J. at this time's doing the color commentary with uh, with with ESPN radio and he, and he and I are doing the game and um, PJ tasked me on the shoulder says, Hey, do you know Paul Allen? And I said, well, I, I, I do. And Paul looked at me with that look and says, I, I don't know you. And, um, <laughs> uh, and I said, well, Paul, we I met you at the Bellevue post office, like back in 95. <laughs> I just, cause I used to live there in Clyde Hill and would run by the post office, and I saw him. I figured, hey, that's Paul Allen. I'll go introduce myself. You know, hey, hey Paul, how you doing? And, uh, and you know, we, we didn't really have a discussion of, of any length. And uh, so, so there courtside, he's looking at me, and I said, but you know, I said, that's, uh, y- you wouldn't even remember me there. And he says, well, what are you doing now? I said, well, I'm doing this and this, that. You know, I'm freelancing at the time. It's post-Sonics. And uh, he was wondering where I was living, and I said, Seattle. And, and he looked at me and said, really, Seattle? So I said, yeah, well, I've got four kids. They all live in Seattle. Really? I said, yeah, and they're big Seahawk fans. And uh, he was amazed at that. Uh, <laughs> really? I said, well, Paul, anybody that's born in Seattle is a Seahawk fan. You've got to understand that. And he just thought, you know, okay. Um, to me, that was it. Told me a lot. Very, he was a, a humble guy when it came to that kind of stuff. I mean, for somebody who's accomplished all this and has all this and and has been in, involved in so many projects, he always came off to me as being a somewhat shy, humble guy. And uh, he said, "Well, he said, well, what would you want to do?" And I said, "Well, I I like what I'm doing now, the freelance stuff." I said, "But I want to be with an NBA t- team. I really want to be with a club. I've had." Some some discussions with other teams if they're across the country. I don't want to move. I'm not moving my family. I said I just you know that's just me. I said if I can stay in the uh, in the on the coast, I, I'd prefer to do that. And I said, but I, I want to do an NBA team. So I said, well, that's interesting. So I didn't think anything of it. And a couple of days later, I get uh, a phone call from the chief executive officer of the Blazers and uh, Chris McGowan and said, you know, we're we're probably going to make some changes here, and uh, if we do, we want to know if, what your, you know, interest is. And I said, well, I, it can't hurt to talk. And so, and you know, being involved in the business, you know how things can change. And so things changed down there in their organization uh, with their broadcast team, and 
uh, they brought me in for a couple of discussions and then just decided, you know, they wanted to, wanted to hire me. So yeah, really was, fortunate huh, was, that you were able to uh, stay in the Northwest. Yeah, I was, I was very fortunate indeed. I was surprised at the opportunity, but you know, decided it was the best, best opportunity for me and the family. Yeah. Well, fans are fortunate to have you, man. I mean, it's, it's great to oh, hear thanks. your voice again. And, uh, it's great that you're, you're, uh, you're still involved in the NBA and calling all those games and, um, you know, people still talk about you and listen to you up here, and, and uh, they remember those good old days. You yeah. Know? Well, you know, hopefully those days will be uh, revisited. We'll see. <laughs> you know. But you and I are running out of our days, so we gotta, <laughs> we better get this thing on the yeah, road. Yeah, I know. That's the other thing. It's like I've, I've read where you're just going to go until your body stops. Yeah, but, uh, yeah. But, you know, there are broadcasters that go – you know, well into their seventies to keep doing this, oh, man. Yeah. But man, to have the the pipes that and you I, have, and I don't know how they do it. To be honest, with you. I really don't. <laughs> well, My gosh. especially well, those old school guys, they call a game a different way. You guys all have your own own way, yeah. but yours is so powerful, man. I don't know how much longer you're that yeah. those pipes can hold up, Kevin. <laughs> man, oh man, and all that travel and days on the road and yeah. time spent in hotel rooms. Yeah. I, it's just, yeah, I, I, I vowed I'd never be a lifer, but. Here I am. I guess I, I kind of am. You know, it kind of happens. It just happens. Well, it's awesome catching up with you, man. Thanks yeah. a lot for, Thanks, uh, for doing this for Appreciate us. Appreciate it, man.